The narrative around climate change often focuses on what you can do as an individual. This makes climate change personal. It becomes a polarizing topic between colleagues, friends and family, and often lets many of the real culprits off the hook. And this is not a new thing. It has been going on for decades. Some people have a deep abiding respect for the natural beauty that was once this country. And some people don't. People start pollution. People can stop it. Okay, well, ignoring the ridiculous representation of Native Americans, this PSA from the 70s has a narrative. It was paid for by Keep America Beautiful, a charity which was funded by the likes of Coca-Cola, the Continental Can Company, and PepsiCo. They describe their initiatives clearly. It's not the product's fault that it is often misplaced in the environment. It is the carelessness of the user of that product. It clearly places blame from the trash produced by Coca-Cola bottles on the consumer. But that was then, when the concept of pollution was something akin to littering. These days, with climate change, it is a more complex web of shifting responsibilities. But the narrative is still the same. You should not fly. You should avoid single-use plastic. You should make sure your electricity is cleaned and you should eat less meat. Meanwhile, the executives of polluting companies sit in their skyscrapers spreading misinformation, plotting how to avoid any loss in profits and lobbying the government to undermine any meaningful environmental legislation. But it is all your fault, really. You, the average Janes and Joes of this world, choose to buy their products and services after all. Never mind the lack of access to affordable green alternatives or the unfairness of putting the financial burden of change on the less well off. In this video, we'll be exploring the complex maze of who is to blame for climate change and who has the power and responsibility to fix it. If you're new here, at Mossy Earth, we discuss ideas and solutions to fight climate change and the loss of biodiversity and then go ahead and implement the most exciting of those ideas through our membership and our underground rewilding projects. If that sounds interesting to you, please consider subscribing and becoming a member. Now, let's get into it. First, let's start by understanding why it is so hard to assign blame and thus responsibility for climate change. Our atmosphere and more broadly our living environment can be defined as a public good. This is how economists define a good that is both non-excludable, meaning that users cannot be barred from accessing or using the good if they fail to pay for it, and non-rivalrous, meaning the use by one person does not immediately prevent access or reduce the availability to others. To illustrate this, you can think of the classic example of a lighthouse. Building this public good will benefit all ships along the coast, enabling them to navigate safely. But you, as an individual fisherman, will have a low incentive to contribute to the building of the lighthouse yourself, as you could simply let others do it and still have all the benefits. In climate change terms, this means that everyone on Earth benefits from a balanced ecosystem and a clean environment. But individuals have the incentive to let others fix the problem and pay for the costs, instead of doing so themselves. Following this logic, the responsibility lies with the individual. And the issue is that some are simply unwilling to step up and would rather let others bear the costs. Let's start by assuming that it is the individual that needs to change. So could you actually fix things if you change your behavior? For some people, it is nearly impossible to get their electricity from a sustainable source, or it is hard to find and afford high quality, low impact food. But one could argue that it is hard, but not impossible. I mean, we lived as a carbon neutral civilization pretty much until the industrial revolution. It was less comfortable, but we still managed. An individual could choose to use a mix of efficient modern technology and relinquishing some 21st century comforts to return to a simpler life with a lower footprint that is in line with our planet's budget. And some people do choose this path and are able to live in this way. So let's assume for the sake of our argument that this is a viable individual pathway. Could we then convince others to do it as well? Humans are notoriously tricky to manage, especially when asked to do something which reduces their comfort or something they perceive as beneficial. A great example of this is the noble experiment of prohibition. The prohibition in the United States was a nationwide ban on the production, importation, transportation and sale of alcoholic beverages from 1920 to 1933. While initially alcohol consumption went down as intended, it quickly bounced back as a black market network popped up. It turns out that forcing people to give up something they like is not an easy task, 
even when it is actually something that is physically killing them. But let's suppose you did manage to convince the majority of the population to change their behavior in a way that has never been experienced before. Would this mass behavior change be enough? Would it solve our problem? The answer this time is unfortunately a clear no. We can draw this conclusion from our very own recent global experiment in mass behavior change. I'm of course talking of the COVID-19 pandemic. The virus changed the behavior of most of the world's population for a while. In the space of a few days, the world ground to a halt, except for the truly necessary activities such as food production. And the impact it had in tackling our environmental footprint was actually very small. The reality is that global emissions only dropped by a meager 7% for 2020. That is well below what we need to achieve in order to stop rapid climate change. It turns out that even while staying at home and drastically reducing our activities, we still consume resources in an unsustainable way. If individuals by themselves cannot alter their behavior enough to solve this problem, then they cannot be the only ones held responsible for climate action. The system limits the options a normal person has available to them, and thus the system must share responsibility for the problem. So to solve our responsibility dilemma, we have to look at how we can crack the lighthouse or public goods problem that we introduced at the start of our story. Essentially, we need to improve our systems to make it easy for all of us to share the burden of climate change. The way we have solved this in the past is pretty much how we got all those lighthouses built to begin with. We formed countries with governments, which through taxation and democratic allocation of resources were able to solve many of our public good problems. When it comes to climate change, governments have the power to enact legislation which can regulate industries, tax pollution and invest in innovation. This means getting governments to stop subsidizing polluting industries and to start taxing their emissions and profits instead. It means investing in a wide range of more sustainable alternatives, such as low-carbon mass transport to replace cars and flights, and clean energy research and infrastructure to make it cheap enough for the average person. Of course, when it comes to systemic change, we also have to realize the shortcomings of our network of countries. Countries can behave much like individuals, shifting blame and being free riders themselves. This puts even more importance on creating and enforcing binding international treaties on climate action, as they are the only way to coordinate action on a global scale. Treaties and all these other initiatives need to be led by governments and other organizations. But ultimately, the individual action versus system change debate is a binary and unhelpful way of thinking. We need to do both. We need to agitate and organize for systemic change while also encouraging changes in individual behavior. And this is where you come in again. You can hopefully vote, but you can also try to get elected yourself while at the same time, you can try to follow a more sustainable diet and reduce your flying. Every single purchase, conversation, and election can be a small step on the way to ultimately solving this problem. Climate change is not your fault, and no, climate change is not your responsibility. But you do have an opportunity to engage this issue on all levels and bring about the change we so desperately need. Now, in between all of those actions, we urge you to consider one more individual action. It won't solve climate change on its own, but it will help restore some wilderness areas and support underfunded biodiversity. I'm of course talking about our very own Mossy Earth membership, and you can learn more about it at mossy.earth or by watching this video right here. Until next time. Cheers!